What's up my friend, I hope you're doing well and welcome back to another video. Today we are taking a look at a very simple technique that you can use to make your orchestrations more balanced, more full, and simply just sound more natural in general. I think a lot of us struggle with uh, creating voicings that just sound full and rich from the very beginning. And then we start to blame things like mixing and arranging when the real problem comes down to just understanding the harmonic series and seeing how the voices work together, which voices are the most important, which ones can be doubled, so on and so forth. And I've done content on this in the past, but I just wanted to kind of reaffirm uh, some of these concepts that I think about and that you should also keep in mind when you're voicing your chords. Really good practice material uh, just to play around with your sample libraries that achieve this. Before we really dive into that though, again, I want to remind you that uh, my brand new course, Virtual Orchestration Mastery is launching next week. And uh, it's going to talk about all the, all the things you need to know basically about orchestration and uh, mastering your mockups and being confident about the virtual orchestra. Um, it talks about things like voicings, it talks about orchestration in general, it talks about sample library techniques, how to get the best out of your instruments, how to orchestrate in different styles. I'm also gonna orchestrate a piece from start to finish right in front of you and then mix and master it and then release it to the world. It's a whole program that I'm, I'm, I'm so excited to share with you. And if you want access to it, if you want uh, to be notified as soon as it goes live, I uh, definitely sign up using the link below and uh, I'll email you as soon as it goes live. Um, I'll also send you a couple free bonuses as well while you wait so you're not just left empty-handed. Um, but yeah, I, I really hope uh, to see you there. And uh, yeah, without further ado, let's kind of jump into this technique. So the main thing to consider is that when in any typical triad, right, like a major and minor triad, the most important note that you could have is the third of the chord. Now, of course, yes, the root really matters because that literally establishes the tonic note. So the root, the foundation of the chord, and the fifth is also important because that shows us that we are creating some sort of chord, right? It could be a suspended chord, it could be uh, something like that, but having the root and the fifth establishes the inside and the outside or the bottom and the top of that chord. But what actually fills in that gap and tells us whether it's a major or minor chord, that comes down to the third, right? So if I play a chord here, a very simple triad, this is a C major chord, whereas if I add the E flat, then it becomes a C minor chord. It sounds a lot sadder and a lot darker, right? Now, when this comes to arranging, or when it comes to actually just voicing in general, because the third note plays such an important role, we can think of this as the most heavy note or the note that makes the biggest influence on how a voice, uh, sorry, how a chord actually sounds in terms of the balance, whether it's heavy, whether it's light and all that stuff. The, the technical reason for this is just due to the harmonic series, the way certain overtones overlap on top of the fundamental note. So as you go up higher and higher, the, the voices start to get closer together so you can have notes that are really close together and not sound muddy at the very top. Whereas if you play at the very bottom, it sounds super muddy because those overtones are all overlapping on top of each other. So considering that the third of the chord is the most important uh, note to influence whether a chord sounds heavy or light, let's put, actually put this into practice. So I'll use a piano first, and then I'll put this into the strings as well so you can see how this sounds. But let's, for example, let's play a C major chord with the third, in this case, the E being super high up. So let's have a quick lesson. I'll just play some roots, I'll play some fifths, and then we have the third there, the E natural at the very top. Right, so one more time. And it has a very bright, it has a very open sound. And if I asked you to put a certain emotion to this chord, you might say it sounds bright, it sounds happy, it sounds, um, you know, uh, fun, right? Now, if I take this E, let's bring it an octave lower. Let's play this E instead, so. Now I would still say it sounds happy and fun, but it also sounds a little richer in a way. And that is due again to the third being an octave lower. So now the heaviness of the chord starts to settle in a little bit more. Let's take this a step further. Let's actually put the E now down an octave around the middle C register. So now we just have. Now this chord starts to sound a little bit more regal, a little more full and rich. And having all of these notes here in the middle, the G, C, and E, the second inversion triad right here, this third really gives us that heavier sound and heavier quality of this C major chord. And finally, let's put it down here, right in the middle. And now you can hear. Now it sounds very, very settled, very fundamental. And now the E is 
basically a few octaves lower than where we started. Let's actually take this to the extreme. Let's put the E down an octave as well. So. Now this, I would say, is undesirable. This is a bit too heavy, and that's because the E is so close to that C in the bottom, right? And you can hear how they kind of clash a little bit. So those overtones are all furiously overlapping on top of one another. So usually the lower you go, the wider apart you want those intervals to be. A general rule of thumb is to start with octaves at the bottom, and then you can incorporate the fifth because it's a lighter note, and then incorporate the third as you go a little bit higher. So I would say as long as you have a chord where the third is around the middle C area, you're pretty much good to go to have a chord that's not going to be overwhelming because any lower than middle C, you start to get a little bit heavier, a little bit warmer, and you might like this effect, but I think if you go below the C3 and put the third in there, it starts to sound a little bit too full, too heavy, right? So let's do a D major chord, same exact thing. This F sharp right there just, just it overemphasizes the quality of the chord a bit. Whereas if we move it up an octave, suddenly it's a lot fuller and cleaner, right? And we're following the harmonic series. We're going a fifth here, we have a fourth here, and now we have a third here. So the intervals are getting smaller and smaller, which is really nice as a byproduct. Let's hear this in the strings as well. You're gonna hear the exact same thing. So here is a C major chord with a third solidly in the middle of the chord rather than at the very bottom. So you hear the third in there, if I remove it, it sounds a lot more empty, right? It's an open fifth. Let's add the minor sound with the E flat. Very nice, right? Nice and dark and full. Let's bring the E flat up an octave. Okay, now it's a little lighter, just a little bit lighter because the note is higher, but also it's the third of the chord, right? Let's actually bring this up an octave higher. So not as full anymore, right? We still hear a minor sound, but that E flat is is making the chord feel a bit lighter and not as intense and dark, right? So the the main point I want to get across here is to take advantage of the third and understand where you are putting your third and where you're voicing it in the chord. The higher up the third is, the less the audience will feel that quality of the chord. So they will still hear if it's major or minor, augmented, whatever it may be, but it's not going to be as strong as if you put the third closer to the middle or around the C3 area. Again, any lower than that though, it starts to get overly muddy. So you wanna avoid that area as well. So again, it depends on the effect you're going for, but a really safe space to be is around the middle C area where you have the third there, right? If the, if the rest of the chord is around this area as well, then it kind of works itself out. Let's say if I, if I have a really high chord, then naturally I can have the third really high up there as well. And that I know it's a C major chord and it's super high up, very light, very airy, and the third slots right in there, you know? But in the context of a big, big full chord that's, that spans many octaves, that's when you really have to think about where you want your third to go. So in traditional uh, doubling rules, um, where if you, let's say you have more than three voices, you have four voices, which note can we repeat or double, right? So if it's a tr traditional C major chord, for example, it is the most um, effective, let's say, to double the root without making the chord feel heavy and overwhelmed. Then next in line would be doubling the fifth. So instead of doubling the C on top, we double the G. So you hear there's a little bit more color there compared to doubling the tonic or the root note, right? Doubling the root is very, very common because again, due to the harmonic series, the fundamental note can double in octaves many, many times. So when you double the root, it's not very colorful. Double the fifth, there's a little bit more color, but when doubling the third, that color really accentuates itself. Like that quality, that major sound really, really comes in a little bit more. And that's again, due to the nature of the third in relation to the root. So let's go through one more example. Let's say I have a huge string chord. How would I voice a C major chord. Let me experiment. All right, let's take a quick look at how many voices we have. We have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine voices. I have one, two, three, four, five Cs or five roots. So those are doubled the most. We have two Gs. Notice that the first G is very low compared to the C, or compared to the E here, actually. But it doesn't sound too, too full and too fat because the G is the fifth of the chord and not the third, 
So we have another G up here. Then we have two E's to really just fill in a third there. So the E up here is totally fine. This E here is adding a bit of extra color, but there you go. It's, it's not overly heavy because it's not like I'm playing the E all the way down here next to the C2, right? So that, that's the main thing I want you to take away here. When you're or orchestrating uh, big chords or even larger passages where you want the chords to be pretty well defined and you want your audience to understand what they're hearing, you want to pay attention to the third of the chord because that will make all the difference uh, for whether a chord sounds nice and full and rich, whether it sounds super duper light and the quality is barely heard, or it's overwhelmingly rich at the very bottom. And again, the, the lower you put your third compared to your root, the more muddy it's going to be, the higher up you go, the lighter it's going to be, but also the less the quality is going to be kind of evident, you know? So it's all a balancing act, but just making sure you play around with it, use your sample libraries, practice, and um, I usually tell my students, like, pr practice on a piano first. Like, if you can hear how it sounds on a piano, usually it will pretty accurately replicate itself to sampled instruments, whether they're strings, woodwinds, or brass, you know? So uh, just, just play around with it, kind of experiment, and this will give you a really good foundation in then taking your voices and then transporting them over to your sample libraries like we just did with an ensemble patch, but even putting them on the individual uh, instruments as well, like violin one, violin two, viola, cello, and bass. And there you can really just hone in on the voices, making sure they're spread out properly, making sure you're following the harmonic series if you want a full resonant rich chord, and then moving on from there. So pretty straightforward, but hopefully this kind of makes sense. And uh, let me know if you have any questions about it. Again, I talk about this stuff and more, much, much more in Virtual Orchestration Mastery, which again is coming out next week. Again, we not only do we talk about orchestration techniques, but actually how to apply that all to sample libraries, get the best out of your samples, make them musical, compose a piece from start to finish, orchestrate a piece from start to finish, and then mix and master it. I'll show you every single thing along the way with no stone unturned. It's super practical stuff. And again, if you want instant access to it and be notified as soon as it goes live, then sign up using the link below. I'll send you a few free goodies along the way as well, and you'll be the first to know when the course goes live. So thank you again for watching. I really appreciate it, and I'll catch you in the next video. Take care, my friend. Bye-bye.